Alright, so Smile is a horror movie that wipes the grin off your face to provide you with two hours of terror. Throughout this video, we're going to be explaining the ending, talking about the potential hidden meaning behind it, and also going over some of the creepy details that elevate it to the next level. The film is based on the short Laura Hasn't Slept, and this unfortunately has been pretty much taken off the internet so it can feature on the Blu-ray. However, it follows the same basic backbone of that, but it develops it in several ways. Smile wears its inspirations on its sleeve, and the movie feels like it's in the same vein as It Follows and also The Ring. Both these films featured a curse that was passed on to someone through one way or another, and this created a target on their back. Creatures stalk the victim, and over time they got closer and closer until they were defeated or the curse won. It's very much the same with Smile, and for the first part of the video, I thought we'd explain what the entity actually is. Now this is a being that attaches itself to victims of trauma, and over time it slowly torments them. Invisible to others, it can appear as anyone, but upon revealing itself, it brings with it a creepy smile. The creature's whole MO is to weaken its victims psychologically to the point it can possess them fully and make them take their own life. It normally does this in front of another person, and in doing so, the curse is then passed on to them. This then starts the cycle over, but there are ways that you can save yourself. If you kill another person in front of someone else, then the trauma will pass on to them, and the curse will continue that way rather than through you. The creature in Smile has a lot of layers to it, and personally, I view it as very much being a metaphor for mental health. In the movie, we discover that Rose's mother died when she was very young, and that Rose could have potentially prevented this by calling 911. However, she didn't, and because of this, her mother has been seen as a suicide victim. A therapist brings this up as a way to explain what's going on, but Rose buries this further inside. Rose has clearly carried this with her for a long time, and it's definitely the thing that pushed her into becoming a therapist. Now the victims all die by ending their own lives after being tortured mentally. The monster appears as a smiling person, and I think herein lies the double meaning. People like Robin Williams have brought attention to the fact that those dealing with depression rarely manifested on the surface. I know from my own experience that when I felt down, I can push it to the back of my mind when I'm in public in order to try and seem happy. I think the fact that it's people ending their own lives and the mental torture that comes before their death is evidence of the duality in the movie. A smile is also something that carries on throughout the film. Smiles are meant to represent someone being happy, however they've been twisted here to have a darker side to them. Yet, this is something that persists throughout the film, and it goes from victim to victim. Smiles are supposed to comfort us, but in this case of the movie, everything is flipped upside down. So turn that frown upside down. Now, we even see a scene in which the characters are forced to smile in order to keep up appearances. At the restaurant, they have an argument, but when the food's put down, they smile and act like everything's normal. I think that there's an analysis of smiles here to show they can often be used to appear a certain way rather than being sincere. My take from it is that smiles are used to mask what's really going on, and they can be used as a way to hide hidden issues going on internally. Now the curse is passed on through trauma, and the fact that Rose is a therapist keeps the film centered around the idea of mental health. Her fiance brings up how she may have inherited her mother's issues, and this trauma could have been passed to her, much in the same way that the curse passes on to others. We even open the movie with her speaking to a patient call, and he describes all the things that a victim of the curse would see without the actual curse itself. He's dealing with a lot of mental health issues, and he himself is paranoid that something is after him. However, this is actually just a mental health problem rather than being a monster, but I think that the similarities are there on purpose. We're supposed to see how they mirror one another, and because of this, I think the film can be viewed both metaphorically and literally. Rose is someone who witnesses a disturbing trauma, and this brings up past memories of her mother's death. This causes her to lose her relationship with her sister, her fiancé, and also her job. She ends up turning to her past boyfriend and desperately tries to put on a happy face, even though something much worse is going on in her mind. I view the ending as her very much destroying the trauma over her mother's death, which the monster manifests as. Early on, we discover that she kept the house, and even though it's run down, she won't get rid of it. However, she journeys out there in order to burn it down, and finally free herself of the past. In the end though, it will always be there as something she can't escape, and this is why she's taken over by the creature. Rose's entire arc can be seen as a mental breakdown, I love that the movie has this double side to it. She has blackouts, is paranoid, hallucinates, and also breaks things. Her calls for help are ignored by those closest to her, and eventually, it could be seen as something that pushes her over the edge. 
There's even a little line at the start in which her patient Laura talks about how her grandfather died in front of her when she was younger. This of course mirrors Rose too, who had a parental figure die in front of her, which clearly caused a lot of trouble. I love this metaphor of how the doctor becomes the patient, and she starts to live through the experience she initially dismissed. Now whether you want to view the monster as real or not is entirely up to you, and for the next part of the video, I want to go about how the movie presents it. After Laura slits her own throat and Rose's practice, the latter starts to witness strange things. Smiles litter the film, and Laura slits her throat in emotion that creates a line like one. This later appears on the sheet over her body, and there's also a coffee mug with a smile on the front of it. The way the car is filmed has us tilting upside down so that the skyline appears like a mouth with a face above it. A bit, bit of a reach that, now Cole smiles at her before screaming she's going to die, and there's also a smiling family on the front of the toy box. Her fiancé texts her a smile face emoji, and the cat is also called Mustache, which sits above a mouth like a smile. Uh, um, I said there would be reaches. Now, this cat is killed by either Rose or the monster possessing her. It's presented at her nephew's birthday party, which is like some Game of Thrones level event. Throughout, we see flashes of her mother's death, and the movie not only opens on it, but we get visions of it throughout. We start off zoomed in, but this then pulls out, almost like we're stepping away from it. However, after Rose is cursed, we zoom in once more, showing how she's revisiting this. After a meeting with her therapist, we watch as she practices smiling in the mirror, trying to hide how she actually feels. The birthday party goes worse than Kelly Kapoor's, and Rose once more witnesses the creature smiling at her. She goes to the hospital, and here we see a pain assessment tool, which is littered with smiles. At this point, we get things more in line with the ring, and Rose starts to investigate the chain. This takes her to some lovely drawings of, of smiles, lovely that, some, some lovely pictures of the Joker in there, I think, and she's forced to turn to Joel. Interestingly, Joel is the person who the curse has passed on to next, however, he has a head start on how to defeat it. She heads off from her sisters, eh? and we catch a nephew looking at her as she goes through a hallucination. I was wondering whether the curse would be passed on to him, and who knows if he could pop up in a sequel. Hey kid, wh why are you looking out the window? Wh why ain't you like the video yet? You, you stupid kid, you goddamn f***ing kid, dumb kid. These kids, kids today ain't got no respect. Now from here, Rose goes with Joel to visit the only known survivor of the curse, and we see a smile on the sign for the lobby. Here we learn that he followed a similar path to Rose, and investigated the chain in order to escape it. He says that he found an instant years ago in Brazil, potentially showing the roots of the demon. I did search for demons which originated in South America, but there wasn't any that really matched it. However, if you know any, then make sure you drop them in the comments below. After going home, Rose is once more visited by her therapist, who we learn is the demon masquerading as her. It's the ultimate betrayal of trust, and it shows just how much the creature is weaponizing Rose's mental health. Kind of feel like we get a clear homage here to Alien 3, and Rose decides to murder Carl in order to pass on the curse. However, she hallucinates the entire event, and we get a big face off like Nick Cage in Travolta. Now, her victim here is important, as she goes to the mental health patient rather than targeting someone else. He never did anything to harm her, yet she regards him as being less important than others because of his mental health issues. The fact is that she has more in common with Carl than anyone else, and yet she still targets him. Now in her defence, she doesn't go through with this, and instead she takes herself to her old house in order to shut herself off from everyone. This is so that she can end the curse without anyone else coming into contact with her when she finally dies. Her trip back there is very much one down memory lane in which she confronts her past traumas. The creature takes on the form of her mother, and reveals that it got into her mind because it was so inviting. She was obviously weakened by the trauma, and the entity says that she can't escape her own mind. Rose seemingly takes control back, and she douses it in flames before leaving the house. However, this is a f***ing lie, and after going to Joel's apartment, she realises this is just another one of the creature's tricks. However, the entire monologue she gives is very much her saying that she puts walls up due to her past. Joel got these walls to come down, but she ran away. I honestly kind of like this being the ending of what we get, but again, that's down to my preference of the supernatural force being more of a metaphor. Your mileage may vary on it, but either way the film reveals that Rose hasn't actually left the house, and she sees the creature's true form. It says it will stay with her forever, and symbolically this could mean that she isn't able to escape the guilt and regret she feels over her mother. This is also another reason why she couldn't sell the house. The real Joel arrives and we see as the curse is passed on. 
We get a zoom in on his eye, and this is similar to what happened when the curse was passed to Rose. It's very much a sort of journey into his mind, again showing the mental health metaphor. Now Joel will inherit it, but he has some knowledge on what's going on, whereas the others didn't. He may also be stronger mentally due to potentially not having the past traumas that Rose did. This could be used to his advantage, however, he has very much just seen the love of his life burn herself in front of him, which is enough to ruin anyone's day. I would have shot her, yeah, as soon as I seen the match come out, but where we go from here, who knows. Anyway, that ends the film, and I'd of course love to hear your thoughts on what we took from it. Comment below and let me know, and make sure you subscribe for videos that always put a smile on that face. We are in a competition right now and giving away 3 copies of Top Gun Maverick on the 15th of November and all you have to do to be one of the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the film. We pick the comments at random at the end of the month and the winners of the last one are on screen right now so if that's you, message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch, make sure you check out one of our breakdowns linked on screen right now. Got one for Barbarian if you, if you want a deeper meaning on that, so yeah definitely go head over there right after this. Out of the way, thanks for sticking through the video. I've been Paul, I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.